Well, I want to thank everybody. On 8 o'clock, you know, today, Las Vegas. Did anybody go out last night partying? That guy looks guilty right there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I appreciate you. We appreciate everybody being here this morning. And yes, a lot of good sessions happening. So we, we were uh, feeling like, well, nobody's going to show up to this, but we're really happy you did because we think this is a really important subject uh, that is worth talking about. And interestingly enough, um, and I know Steve was in a session before uh, yesterday morning where this came up a lot about why is HTM not doing more, um, you know, around this area? Why are, why are we not able to show that, for example, if I go back to, you know, the, the right to repair issues, why can't we show that we can do this as, just as well as um, the manufacturers? Well, the reason is, is because we do not have any standardized data to show anybody. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. So, uh, and why this is important and why, you know, if we ever want to get better as an industry and improve and demonstrate the value that we have to be able to have standardized practices where we can compare ourselves and have a, a bar that we want to reach and, and everybody be doing things similarly. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that and why that's important. So real quick, before we get started, we're going to introduce ourselves. So just for those of you I don't know, um, my name's Heidi Horn. Uh, last year I started my own consulting firm. Uh, and you know, I wasn't feeling very creative, so I came up with Heidi Horn HM Consulting. <laughs> it's stuck, and that's it, that's it. Uh, so my past experience is I was the VP of Healthcare Marketing and uh, VP of Healthcare Industry uh, Solutions at Nuvolo, which is a CMMS company, if you're not uh, aware of who they are. So I was there for about four years. Um, also was a VP of Healthcare Technology Management at SSM for 13 years and total of 20 years in HTM there. So I uh, have a, a pretty broad uh, HTM background. Um, uh, so very involved with the Association for the Advancement of Medical Instrumentation from 2005 to present and uh, I currently serve on the Amy's Board of Directors as their treasurer. I have uh, been nominated as the chair elect for the 2000, what, June 2024, June 2026 timeframe. Uh, previous chair of Amy's Technology Management Council and inaugural member of the Amy's Fellow Program. Um, also was uh, honored to receive the 2019 HTM Leadership Award. So, if, if you're an Amy member, you should have received a, a proxy vote for the new board directors. So be sure you uh, you vote so that uh, Heidi has enough votes to be the, the new chairperson. So, <laughs> so I, I'm Kurt, um, also a clinical engineer, and I see your creativity, Heidi. Can't raise it because uh, you know my consulting firm is Think Clinical Engineering LLC. I, I had the privilege of working for um, decades, about 36 years, for the Department of Veterans Affairs um, and serving veterans. Are there any veterans in the room? Thank you for your service. Thank you for your service. So yes, and working with a fabulously talented group of HDM professionals um, in VA. Um, real treat and a real, real nice ride. Um, um, also um, uh, active with with Amy and ACC, um, and on and like Heidi, I'm on the Amy Board of Directors. So look forward to this session. I would say or ask you to. Um, there's another session this afternoon on standards. So, I mean, if nothing else, catch catch the wave, right? There's there's a doubling down on standards. I think increasing recognition that from you know, thought leaders in HTM that we need standards. Um, so go to that session. It's going to, or if you go, it's going to talk more about the, the, the standards themselves, maybe what you should be paying attention to today. What we want to do in this session, you know, Heidi will talk about the objectives in a moment, but I just ask you to, to think ahead. Think, you know, 10, 15, 20 years from now, how, you know, what might a vision be and a more standards-based vision for the HTM profession and healthcare delivery organizations? Okay, we got some more people coming in. Come on in. <laughs> we got you now. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the objectives. Can everybody hear me okay, by the way? I know I'm kind of turning around. I apologize. Uh, I want to get this straight, though. So we're going to talk a little bit about the current state. So, you know, review the impact on the HTM industry caused by the lack of standards. And again, I should stress, this is an interactive session, by the way. So, you know, we have we don't have that, that many people that if you have some questions as we go, 
you can ask questions or chime in with your thoughts on something. Um, explain what standards are and are not and how they are different from regulations and guidelines. Uh, provide an overview of what HTM standards and guidelines have been published or are in the works. Now, I actually had that uh, slide up. We took some of that out. So the session that he was just talking about that uh, Matt Bertich is going to be doing later this afternoon is going to go more into that. We had a conversation, you know, it's like, okay, you take that, we'll take this. So he's probably going to go further into, we'll, we'll mention a few, but he's going to go further into that. Uh, and then the future state, describe the benefits and the disruption. So what we want you to kind of come my way is that standards are great, but there is some disruption. You know, there's some, there's going, it doesn't happen very easily and, and policies would have to change and procedures will have to change. Um, except or help accelerate standards adoption by educating the HDM industry, um, all of you, and how equipment management standards can improve patient safety, equipment design and reliability, and the overall operations of HDM programs. And then um, finally, we want to encourage participation. So one of the things that, you know, I think hopefully will become clear out of this is I think all of you realize that a lot of times um, there's regulations that are created, and I'm going to use my, my favorite one is 100% PM completion. And everyone's like, what does that mean? And what is that? And, you know, who can do that? Um, it's been written by people who don't necessarily know the HDM, or HDM industry. And so if it, we can create standards written by people who are in the industry, who understand how the day-to-day -day operations work in a hospital and the HDM operations work, we're obviously going to come out with much better standards than we would if people are just trying to take a stab at it who might not have all the understanding of how that works. So, okay. So I'm going to, this is participation, okay? So wake up, drink your coffee, okay? But by a show of hands, and I'm going to assume most of you have, are in HTM organizations, okay? So it, you got to be honest here, you know, and we're not, we're not judging, but be honest. So by a show of hands, in your HTM organization, do you have, a, have adopted all the work order type codes suggested by Amy CMMS Collaborative Guide? So if you have adopted all of them, okay, so we got one person, okay? So or use the same work order type codes plus some others that you've used for a long time, okay? So raise your hand. Okay, so, and then some of you aren't raising your hand. What do you think? <laughs> I'm saying I'm on to you. Yeah, okay. So, uh, so, okay, so that's, we got one person who's adopted these guidelines. Everyone else is kind of doing their own thing, which is fine. So I'm proving a point here. Uh, so close the PM work order after searching for the device once and not locating it. So you're going out. So one time you go look for it, can't find it, close the work order. Nobody does that. Your texts don't do that. Are you sure? Okay. I find that, find that hard to believe. Or, okay, close the PM work order only after attempting to locate it two or more times. Okay. So we're, we're pretty standardized on that in this room. But I can tell you a lot of them just close it. So. Uh, call your department healthcare technology management. Okay. Uh, okay. Or call your department clinical engineering or biomed or or something else. Okay. So, so you see where we see where we're going here. <laughs> uh, use the formula of severity times probability to determine your equipment's risk code. Okay. Some of you. Yeah. So you're kind of eh 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 eh. Or use some other method to determine your equipment's risk. Okay, so the point of this is you can see, again, no judgment, no nothing here, but um, as an industry, we're kind of all over the place, and these are just a few examples, you know, the list really goes on and on and on, and, um, you know, from my days at New Volo, I really do know this, because working with different organizations and trying to figure out and configure their CMMS to um, align with their policies and procedures, it became very, very clear that most organizations were very, very different in how they attempted this. So you can see the challenges here. So current state, again, is very few standardized best practices have been adopted across the industry. Each HTM organization customizes its own operating procedures. And what this results in, quite frankly, is we have different CMMS nomenclature codes, such as the work order type, failure code, response codes, equipment description, you know, on and on and on. So we're all using different things in our CMMS. We have different methods for determining technician staffing needs. So I can't tell you as a consultant now, I get a questions a lot about, hey, can you tell me, you know, what is the norm out there for how many technicians I should have by devices or something like that? Or 
there's no standard. There's no, no there's nothing that, there's nothing I can compare it to because everybody does it differently. So again, there's no data to have people um, go to their C-suite and go to their leadership and say, I need, oh, that mic's got to. Mm hmm. Yeah. I, I would I would say it is, but it would be if the problem is we're creating or uh, we're comparing apples to oranges a lot of times. Yeah. And so if the data is not, again, standardized, it's very hard to say that this is, you know, like think about how you inventory equipment, for example. You know, some people, they just inventory the imaging room. Other ones, image, you know, inventory every single thing. So it just throw, it skews everything. Did anybody else have, did I see? Okay. Right, right. Yeah, and so I I'm, and I'm forgot that I'm supposed to repeat the question because they're recording this. So as Vincent says, um, there are, there are uh, there's a lot of data out there and everything else. The the point of that is, um, again, it's it's coming in with different, you know, apples uh, apples to oranges is the best way I can describe it. And so it has to be scrubbed and everything else. So whereas we had data coming in that was all, you know, we we knew that we were comparing the same to the same. Um, we wouldn't have to go through that scrubbing process and everything else. So that's where we're kind of getting at here. Um, so different policies and procedures to be compliant with regulations. And, and this is always interesting to me because it's the same regulations, let's say, but again, I'll go back to that 100% PM completion thing. Everybody kind of interprets that one a little bit differently. And so I, you know, we've heard PM compliant, we've heard PM completed, do you close the work order as, as completed, do you leave it open? Right, well thank you, because I you know that was my PM guide. Um, so, so that is, but again, everyone is doing that differently because there are no real, there's a guideline, but there's no standards that people have adopted. Um, and then different metrics to measure performance is another one where, you know, what I hear a lot, you know, I have a, a high performing HTM organization. Well, compared to what and how do you know that, you know, kind of thing. He said that uh, Herman says that there is no such thing as compliant, but I would argue that Herman approved the PM compliance guide. So <laughs> I uh, will I'll have to talk to Herman about that one. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I imagine that has to do from the CMS verbiage is. Uh, completion. But the question is, is is it complete if you touch the device or is it complete if you went right? But right, cor correct. It does not exist. There, there is a guide, but it, that's, I'm not going to go into that one. <laughs> so, well, that that's a whole discussion, but thank you for the, the clarification. So, yeah, yes. You know, again, the list goes on and on. And, and, you know, the point is, I like to always make is that every HTM organization is a snowflake. You know, we're all different, unique. And you know, did you notice that you want me to back that up? It's really kind of cool. Hold on a second. This is a well, I'm doing it, of course, now. Um, so anyway, the, you know, and that I understand that there are differences. So you have urban hospitals, you have rural hospitals, you have you know small, large hospitals, children's hospitals. But if you think about it, about you know at least 98 percent, and I'm, you know, I'm swagging this one, but um, of everything that we do is the same. We have the same medical equipment for the most part. We have the same regulations we have to adhere to. We have, you know, clinicians, we have patients. So there are so many opportunities that we can standardize and focus on that 98% of things that we can standardize on versus the 2% that might be very unique to our, you know, situation in the hospital. Okay. So, so what? So, you know, we've talked a little bit about what the current state is and everything. So why should we even care? <laughs> you know, we, why can't we continue to be unique and different than the snowflake? Well, the impact of a lack of standards on the HTM industry is it takes more time for everyone to reinvent the wheel versus adopting a proven standard. I love this graphic because, okay, here's everybody's attempt to, to invent the wheel. And whose wheel is better? I don't know. I guess it depends on what you have. But um, 
you know, everybody thinks their wheel is the best wheel. And I can tell you that for a fact. <laughs> they do. Everyone thinks that their department is the best and that they are doing it the best way, the right way, everything. Um, and that's not always necessarily the case because, again, we have no way of comparing ourselves that well to each other. Um, there's very level, varying levels of performance. Again, not everybody can be the best. We know that. Um, so there are some people, and usually what happens is that they have um, departments with many best practices, but they're not all best practices. And then there's other departments who might have a best practice you know, here. So what we need to do is identify those best practices that truly are best practices that help us perform um, better, help the, you know, us hit our, what our goals of having safe medical, reliable medical equipment, um, and then adopt those universally. Uh, increased costs. So again, coming from the CMMS industry, and I know, Steve, I worked with you for a while there on, on, on when we were doing the Nuvolo thing. It's very interesting to me um, about how much extra cost, time, and effort goes into just configuring a CMMS to be in alignment with a organization's HTM policies and procedures. And so because everybody's different, and you know, again, I get it, but you have to, if you think about it, your CMMS has to align with those policies and procedures. If you say you're gonna open up a work order, um, you know, for every incident, you know, your, your CMMS has to do that. If you say you're going to um, close the work order after looking for the device twice, you know, and you wanna automate that process, then your CMMS has to do that. Um, and so because everybody is uh, different though, you're configuring the CMMS different for everybody, which makes it more costly. <laughs> That's why, you know, we, I hear, I was listening to people like, what, my CMMS used to cost $20,000 a year. Now I'm paying, you know, blah. So, uh, well, that's why, that's why, and then the support piece of it too. If it's not working properly, um, you got all these people back, you know, somewhere trying to figure out, okay, how, how is it supposed to work for their instance? Um, and then they're not familiar with your instance. So that's just one example, by the way. And, and the list goes on and on about how these costs are driven up in the time, effort, everything else, because we're all different. Um, it's more difficult to manage customized processes, it's difficult to benchmark and compare performance against other HTM departments, and it makes it more difficult to share solutions to common problems impacting the HTM industry. So again, at this this conference, Amy conference, you know, we keep hearing like, here's how do we get past this? Well, it becomes challenging when we are all doing it a little different. Mike, um, but so for those of you who don't know, William Edwards Deming is considered one of the the best economists. You know, he's the, he's the one that uh, Econ 51. If you ever had that in college, you know. You learn all about him, um, and he's the father of the third wave of the Industrial Revolution. Actually, he's really given um, uh, credence for the post-war um, economy in Japan, and he helped create some of the um, very, um, you know, radical and, and transformative um, type of uh, policies that happened in Japan after the, the World War II. So what, some of the things that he said, and I thought this was interesting. So uncontrolled variation is the enemy of quality. So again, if everybody's a snowflake, it's hard to get better. Uh, two basic rules of life are change is inevitable and everybody resists change. And I think we can all agree in this in, in HTM, that is definitely true. And put a good person in a bad system and the bad system wins no contest. I love that one because it's true. Like, in the, you know, again, going back to CMMS, if you had a, have a bad process in your CMMS, it's gonna keep spitting out bad, you know, bad data, bad information. So just so you know what standards are not, um, I love Dilbert. Who, who, does anybody know who Dilbert's dog is? I couldn't remember. I was trying to remember. What is Dilbert's dogbert? Thank you. Okay, good. So Dilbert's dogbert is here, and he says, uh, for those of you who are uh, on the recording, each of you has been chosen to represent the interests of your respective companies. On, this is a standards meeting. And they said, and Dogbert says, as you know, the best way to create standards is to mash together a bunch of mutually exclusive preferences. And then um, says, I, I hope I'm not uh, the only one who joined this group just for the laughs. So, you know, the point is, is that you can't, standards are not taking a bunch of mutually exclusive um, policies, procedures, and mashing them together and hope that you have now a good policy and procedure. And so what that's gonna require is people to agree on things. It's gonna require, you know, that we say, okay, this is the way we're going to do this. 
And that's been challenging, as we know, in the past to uh, get HM industry to get there. So uh, what are standards? How am I doing on time? So uh, standards are co or, or codes are typically developed within a standards development organization. They promote standardization of products, supplies, policies, and procedures, spell out expected performance and technical specifications regarding processes, services, and products. I mean, I know you all know this, but and there's a difference between standards and codes. So uh, standards are norms or requirements, including uniform criteria, methods, processes. So these are really what we're talking about today, by the way. Yeah. Well, that's those are things that, yeah. So, and so that's what we're gonna, and he's gonna talk a little bit more about standards as well, but. So the nomenclature would become a standard. So what you have to understand is, you know, we talk about standardization, which is just basically we all decide, okay, we're all going to do this. And they do have guides, by the way. Amy has uh, guides on that nomenclature right now, like work order, uh, they um, rec recommendations for work order names, uh, failure codes, that sort of thing. So there are free, I believe they're free out there. Um, and so so what we're talking about today is all of those would go into a standard, but it would have to be developed. You know, we'd have to all come come together through an SDO, um, through a standards uh, process and agree that that will, is our new standard. And then it is published. And I'm gonna talk a, a minute on how that, well, I might as well just get to that right now. Um, okay, so we'll talk about how that happens. So that's, what you're talking about is basically the things that should go into a standard, okay? Just to clarify there. So uh, what are standards? They're consensus documents. So, you know, uh, they are developed by relevant stakeholders, manufacturers, regulators, people such as yourself, people are in the industry, HGM people, um, on, and they uh, in a particular industry or discipline, and they are voluntary. So it's important to understand that standards are voluntary. There are standards out there right now um but the problem one of the problems is that they have not been adopted and they're until they are become part of a regulation like uh you have to adopt this because it's part of the you know you had to adopt the standard because it's a regulation people aren't necessarily going to do it <laughs> and so again the challenge becomes is getting these standards out there developing these standards and then going to cms uh, FDA, others, and having them adopt that as regulation so that they do become uniform. Um, and the point I'm trying to make here is that wouldn't we rather, as an industry, create those standards than have CMS, Joint Commission, somebody who might not necessarily understand the day-to-day -day workings of a hospital tell us what those standards should be? And, and that's the point of all of this. Um, so uh, they're reviewed periodically every five years. And again, you know, I mentioned that uh, they don't, they are not voluntary or they are not required unless they become a, a regulation. So, so this is a standard, unfortunately, um, you know, and it's, it's worth noting because I think uh, standards don't happen overnight. This is, this is a lengthy multi-year process. Has anybody in here been involved in a standards uh, development? So you can speak to this. Yeah, it is a lengthy, arduous process. Yeah. So again, for the recording, you know, you're talking about the, um, the length of time that sometimes is behind the technology. And by the time you get to the standard, technology has moved on. Is that what I heard correctly? Okay. Um, so yeah, you can see, so uh, again, this is a, a typical, this is on average. Mike, did you have a question? Well, this, I got this actually from Amy. So well, I think this is it. <laughs> yep. So I, I think it's, a, and Amy told me that I had to say this. Um, it's worth noting that, you know, I think we, we've come up as an industry, a lot of ideas about what should be a standard, but there is a proposal process and a review process that it goes through. And just understand um, that not all things that we think are great um, to be standards become standards right away. There's like anything, there's um, you know resource challenges. Again, what I'm hearing is that there's a lot of challenges just getting enough HTM people to participate um in these because again it's it's a long process so it's uh every you know everybody's busy so um just understand that but this is the general uh process map for it okay i think this is you right okay i'm good i'm good uh, i'm just on that last point i think some of us are so eager and can see and by us i, I include you guys in the room because you're interested in standards 
um, can see how standards can benefit us in healthcare, and we want to get there quickly. So sometimes we make Amy a little bit nervous because we're pushing the envelope. Let's move a little faster. Let's be a little bit more nimble and agile. Um, so, you know, hence their request to to us to um, you know to remind ourselves and the group that standards don't come together overnight, um, which is true. So I'm going to zoom out a little bit, um, talk a little bit more broadly um, than you know what we are you know primarily focused on within HTM for a little bit here. Um, and again, think big picture, think future facing uh, going forward. A um, little bit here on standards that are in place um, and do exist today. Um, what color do you think of like piped oxygen in, in hospitals? There we go. Um, how about medical air? Medical vac? White on black. Black on, yeah. So, so there, there's an example, right? Standards exist, codes exist. 20 people in the room, we probably got 10 or, 10 or 15 states here, and you guys all are using the same, same thing, right? And if you note right there, pin index, right? Some of you probably remember the days when we didn't have standards for the pin indexing, and we had some unfortunate patient outcomes or incidents. Yeah, because, um, right? Because one regulator was being plugged into the wrong, you know, supply, right? So there's, a, there's an example. What, what's DICOM? You use DICOM standard in your practice? What's it mean to you, right? Um, just give me a general context of or sense of what, what you think of when you hear DICOM. Imaging, there we go, there we go, right? So there's a standard, right? An ISO standard born from, um, you know, radiology uh, Congress and, you know, back in the days when you had to connect you know, a laser printer to a CT scanner. You know, there's a lot of custom configuring going on there. Now it's almost plug and play, right? Thanks to the DICOM standard. Standards in action. I'm curious what EQ56 means to you guys. You know what it is? And I'm, I'm interested to know how it drives your practice, if it drives your practice. Again, to Heidi's point earlier, there's no judgments here. We're just genu genuinely curious to know you know, is EQ56 something that's all of your staff would be well aware of and you do something because of EQ56 standard? Um, just just an example of, you know, of Amy standards that are not just the EQ management type standards like 56 and 89 and others, right? Medical devices, instrumentation. Um, there's been a lot of work through the decades, you know, 50 plus years Amy's been around. And that's what a lot of their work has been is what what is a universal ECG lead? or trunk cable, what does it look like, right? So your supply chain people can buy lead sets from multiple vendors, get competition with their procurement, and as long as it meets the, the Amy ANSI standard, it's it's gonna work. Now, that's a good point, and at least in the United States, the FDA is you know, trying to get its arms around this and putting out guidance about remanufacturing and what is remanufacturing. Yeah, the, the, question, the question was, um, you know, there are a lot of Amy standards that are well adopted sterilization dialysis and other areas why hasn't that same adoption occurred um, in the hcm equipment management space um, and a lot of it's the standards development process when the amy, amy convenes the standards group we as a community are very sensitive and this is things theory here talking but we're very sensitive to the impact on others and i might Think I can, uh, you know, adopt the standard in my organization, but I'm concerned that you're at a smaller hospital. You don't have the funding. You don't have the bandwidth that my hospital might, or vice versa. And so, we water down that standard to a degree that it really doesn't have the impact that we all would like it to have. That's starting to change, which is a good thing. Starting to change. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Good. I'll we'll, we'll, we'll probably talk a little bit more about that as as we we go through a couple of the slides. So standards are ever evolving. Um, I think a little bit to the to the good point about innovation. Um, when standards are published, a lot of times the hard part is getting that standard out in the first place. It is revised or reissued or reaffirmed um, every five years or so, at least you know in the Amy Ansi environment, every five years or so. Um, in fact, EQ56 is being revised as we speak. One of the 
the features of the new EQ56 will go to quality management systems to your question earlier. And there will be you know, a stronger push that the HTM team or group entity adopt one of those quality management systems that are used in healthcare. Yes, Ben Singh. Good, good question. The question is kind of the difference between a recommended practice and a standard. Um, by definition, a standard is not necessarily code or required. Well-constructed standards with appropriate subject matter expertise input, to your point earlier, are generally highly adopted. That's why we see sterilization and dialysis communities having highly adopted. I don't know off the top of my head if the EQ56 revision will still have in the title recommended standard, a recommended practice, or if it will just drop that and say this is a standard. That's really where it should be going. Right, not rec decrease the recommendation, even though you don't have to. So thanks. Yeah, basically that's a, you know goes to your point earlier. Why have why has HTM and EQ st standards not been further adopted? You know, there's a heavy emphasis on recommended practice in the legacy standard. So as that gets updated and evolves, so so noted. Been saying thanks. Yeah, 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 yeah. Again, uh, yeah, and I think I think the semantics are, are not unimportant, but we, you know we're all in, in context here. We want to get to a more standard practice way of practicing. We want to have standards that help define our practices and drive our practices. New standards emerge again. Just some examples here. EQ 110 is is on education programs for HTM biomedical engineering. So that's well underway and will be published not too distant future. Um, so, you know, Amy can talk more and you can go online and see the statuses of, of Amy's standards um, in their online standards monitor. Um, so new standards initially can be difficult to adopt. And part of our theme here is it's, it's not easy. We all have to be willing to get outside of our legacy practices to embrace and adopt a new way of practice. Once we're there though, very often, you know, fast forward a few years, we couldn't imagine life without, operations without working this way. Right, does that make sense? I mean, I think, think of how often have you helped, you know, clinicians roll out a new electronic health record as an example, right? Hard, big change for them. And I'm probably dating myself, you know, back when we went from paper to electronic digital world, right? Um, you know, a lot of pushback. But now you take the, you know, you can, the computer, the electronic health records down for five minutes and there's panic, right? Oh no, how do we do patient care, right? So wouldn't it be nice to be at that point in some time where we're all really singing off the same song sheet? Yes. Yeah, that, that's kind of, Heidi went through the standards development process, kind of comes from that process and Amy has an overarching EQ equipment uh, uh, stand, uh, group that will help prioritize the suggestions that are received and submitted by, by, by you, exactly. Yes, good question. Um, so, so a future state, again, I, we want you to envision a future state. How might standards benefit the HTM profession industry, what we do? to improve patient outcomes, to take care of the technology and medical equipment in our facilities. Um, you know, just think ahead, just for sake of discussion, the year 2040, what could things look like? And so think about that and why you're thinking about that. I'm gonna step through what one large healthcare organization that I'm very familiar with because I worked there for, for a long time is the VA. How VA you know, designed and developed some standards and more importantly, the benefits that VA is, has realized from having those standards. So, and, that, and then we'll come to, you know, just sort of a little bit of brainstorming session on what, what would address some of your pain points um, into the future. So the VA, 172 hospitals, you know, a million medical devices um, valued at, you know, I think nine or $10 billion now. So stand, about, about a decade, maybe a little bit more than that, 12, 13 years ago, an effort in earnest really was embarked on in VA. Instead of, at the time, there was 170 hospitals, for the most part, 170 HTM programs, biomedical programs at the time, sprinkled across the country, right, in every state, et cetera. Some commonality, 
but quite a bit of delta and differences in how they did their business. So um, standardization, we went into it. And kind of the point earlier, it was, you know, think broadly. It wasn't just data, although data was part of it. Scope of services. What is it that HTN is responsible for? Right, so th you can see here some of those, I mean, nomenclature, I, I don't know if you're familiar with ECRI's medical device nomenclature system, right? That, that's an example of a, you know, a useful resource that's out there that many HTM programs have adopted for asset nomenclature standards, right? So we, we took that, VA took that and adapted it slightly. And, and now every VA hospital calls their defibrillator a defibrillator or a CT scanner a CT scanner instead of a scanner dash CT or computed tomography scanner, right? It's all consistent. So there's some examples of the efforts to standard, standardize the practice across 172 hospitals. Um, when my wife was, you know, she, she came into my office when she was developing some of these slides, looked over my shoulder and saw something about standards and she, you know, she said, probably before I saw her, she thought, and she said, thank goodness there are people like you guys that are, you know, are into standards. Well, this is why I get excited about standards. This is the results of some of that standardization within VA that came out, you know, equipment safety alerts. Since we call a CT scanner, VA calls a CT scanner, CT scanner. There's a safety recall that comes from GE on a particular make and model. Centrally, it can be recognized who's got that CT scanner and make sure that that facility received that safety recall, and then follow up to make sure that they take the remediation action recommended by GE. And if they didn't, there's visibility to why they didn't. And maybe they need some assistance, whatever that assistance may be, right? As an example, data analysis could be looked at over a whole fleet of you know, 95,000 infusion pumps. What's the make and model distribution? What's the performance? What's the reliability? What are the use errors, et cetera? across that whole fleet. Cybersecurity risk management could be done in a much more consistent fashion. Again, it's not just about the processes inside of HTM, but the, the quality and caliber of HTM staff increased because there are some educational standards um, that, that emerged, right, that were developed. Resultingly, in, the staffing itself increased, right? So, you know, I don't know many HTM departments that say we're we're fat and happy with our staffing levels. <laughs> Generally, we want to need more staff, but we were able to put out this, you know, the, we talked about benchmarking earlier, performance monitoring, continuous improvement using data. And from headquarters, you know, I didn't have to to direct staffing levels at hospitals. All I had to do was, was share a dashboard, a report card with the hospital administrator. And if he or she saw, you know, in the red on turnaround time for corrective maintenance, write to the biomedical chief, HTM chief, what's going on here? How can we improve this, right? Long and short, you know, over time, they realize more resources are needed. And over, you know, over an eight or nine year period, you know, the, there was a nearly 100% increase in staffing across the, the whole enterprise. So, you know, couple that with, emerged functions and responsibilities like cybersecurity risk management, right? Um, so those are, these are some of the, you know, some of the benefits of standards, having standards in place and how those standards can be used to benefit HTN teams, which in turn benefits, right, care delivery. Dave. Um, that's happening now. It's starting to happen now. Part of it was the, you know, the, the CMMS that VA uses is homegrown, very antiquated. Um, so there, there are regions, there are regions, uh, 18 regions in the VA, and we did that at the region level. So a region would have seven or eight or nine hospitals and a bunch of clinics. So within the region, they would look at AEM as a vision. Absolutely. So this put in the infrastructure to do that kind of activity for sure. Yep. Yep. 
I talked about scope of service standards, right? What, what is the core function? What's the responsibility of HTM teams? There were a lot of HTM teams that didn't do equipment planning. You know, this is a core function. You know, clinical leadership wants HTM's involvement and leadership in capital equipment planning so that they're more likely to have current state-of-the-art medical equipment. So that became a standard practice. And those hospitals that didn't have clinical engineers or managers or the depth of resources to take that function on, you know, got those resources and took that function on. Be right, be right with you. Let me get to these last couple of bullets. The C-suite engagement went up dramatically. We all, you know, recognize the importance of C-suite engagement. Again, with things like report cards and, you know, national reports on cybersecurity vulnerabilities with uh, implementation of remediation of, of uh, safety recalls and the like. Um, they were much more engaged, much more aware, much more supportive from the C-suite of the HTM teams. Okay. Um, yes, question. Hold that, hold it one second then. Hold it, because we're going to come to that, please. <laughs> going to gonna open that up. So that, that's where we're coming exactly to. So thanks for the segue. So just a, a strategic planning term called backcasting. Right? A lot of us have heard of forecasting, backcasting. And when, I'm not going to go into the theory behind backcasting in part because I'm not an expert myself, but it really is about envisioning a future state years into the future. I mean, think you're going to climb Mount Everest. You know, picture yourself on the top of Mount Everest, what it's like to be there, and then kind of go backwards. What is it that you needed to do to climb that mountain, right? So this is what we want to do here for a few minutes is this exercise of picture 2040. And you know, what, could, what kind of standards could we put in place or should we consider that would, be, you know, would make a, you know, a more successful future state? HTM in, in 2040, take off your, you know, where we are today, where we're mired with, you know, thin resources, our, our hospital systems constraints, try to think unconstrained as we envision a future. Think about your pain points and what, you know, what would there be if there was a standard way of doing something, how might that positively impact some of your pain points? Okay, so we will take a few minutes here just to, to brainstorm together, if you don't mind. And let's start with your suggestion or question. Thank you. Thank you. That's a good, good point. Use common, you know, common, common language, understandable language. Second grader can read it and understand it. No disrespect to anybody. And, but with that said, standards, right? There are words that have meaning, right? There's a difference between should and shall. Huge difference, right? And so making sure that those are, those differences are understood by the community. Yes. Being absolutely honest, but uh, but um, <laughs> but the biggest problem that I see, uh, especially uh, because I'm involved in this particular part of healthcare, is uh, rural healthcare is completely different than the uh, organizations that you've been tending to, and uh, so the breadth of responsibilities of biomed and the vision of what biomed is to the administration of these small and rural hospitals that are constantly being closed and can't afford insurance for keeping their ER open and things like that uh, is so different that uh, standardization of what biomed really is uh, between larger institutions and uh, and uh, hospitals that are calling themselves hospitals, but uh, but they really don't understand what uh, biomed is. They don't even have equipment inventory half the time when I walk in. Then, uh, you know, standardization of that, so they know what they are up against and what they should be, uh, what criteria they should be meeting. That would be pretty basic standardization, I would think. Excellent. 
Excellent. Thank you. Yep. Right on. And when I showed the VA, you know, that that's kind of what the VA tried to tackle with scope of service, core functions. What is, what are the responsibilities of, of HTM? And, and it, yeah, you take that further into the outpatient environment and the rural environments. Correct. Correct. And a lot of times, I, I, sometimes we're our own worst enemy, right? And we start saying, well, you know, I don't, I don't take care of imaging technology. So, you know, but, but should you? You know, I don't go. I don't go out to the outpatient clinics or into the home. Well, maybe we don't go out there to repair the equipment, but from a risk management perspective, maybe that risk management should be part of our core function and responsibility. Right? Right? Hospital executives still don't realize that HTM Biomed is responsible for medical device cybersecurity. Right? Clearly identified within that scope of responsibility and core functions. Good. Correct. Correct, correct. Again, our own worst enemy, a lot of times we say, no, I can't take that on. I'm already understaffed. Well, we need to flip that narrative and say, okay, yes, that should be our responsibility. It makes sense. Who else in the hospital is going to do that? We'll take that on. Now let's resource it accordingly. Staffing, training, education, skills. Good, very good, very good. I mean, picture a database in the cloud, right? Database in the sky, right? And certain anonymized data from all of our facilities and from the OEM, you know, from GE and Siemens and Philips and BD's service team, you know, you know, certain data goes into that database in the sky. And now we, whoever we is, but this community is able to slice and dice that data. And why wouldn't there be a maintenance procedure or protocol that is de facto standard for all of us? And we all don't have to create our own AEMs. This doesn't mean that you can't deviate from that, right? And that's another scary thing about standards often. Oh, you're gonna stifle my creativity, my ingenuity, the innovation. But if there's a reason for me to deviate from this national, international PM protocol, then maybe that reason applies to others too. And that should be an adjustment to that protocol. Or maybe it's just unique to me and the environment that I'm working in. And then that's okay, document it and I have that deviation approved. Well, well said. Yep. Two quick comments on that. One is use error instead of user error. Sounds subtle, but it's less direct. You know, sometimes the user doesn't, you know, feels accused if it's user error. And a lot of times if it's human factors, shortcoming design, it really isn't the user's issue, you know, responsibility. It can be better design or more training to your point. So good one. Use, use error. Yep. Take off the R. Yes. And, um, yeah, and a, a quick anecdote. I mean, in the early days in VA, once we started rolling out some of the standard terminology, nomenclature, work types, we did do some analysis and of our infusion pump fleet. And we, if, we, if there were three or four predominant manufacturers that we had, one of them was by far an outlier, had way more use errors than the other three. So we worked with that manufacturer. You know, we need the training education need to be better. Do your human factors design need to be improved? What's the reason? So, so good point. And, and not just Amy. I mean, you see on the slide here, there's a lot of entities that are doing standards related work. DICOM wasn't an Amy product, right? So, so don't, don't limit yourself and your staff, you know, to Amy, although certainly get involved in the Amy standards. That, that's fine if that's your interest. And also don't limit it to the EQ area. If you or your staff has particular interest, passion, and technical capability and blood pressure monitors, get on that standard team and be part of that. Um, and Heidi mentioned it earlier, right? This is all of us, right? This is all of us. You guys are change agents. I know Heidi mentioned earlier that a lot of times we're reluctant to change. I like to put a little different look on that too and think about the changes that you and your staff and teams bring to your hospital, right? You're replacing a whole fleet of ICU monitors. Who's the change maker in that situation, right? You guys are driving that project, right? You're leading that project huge change management impact. So I view yourselves in the HTM community as change agents. You just need to get that same motivation to adopt standards as they're developed. 